and welcome to Lunch with Cybus with me, Nadine DeRaza. And me, Stephen Chair. Now, coming up in the program, we're joined by two experts on cyber and customer security, Marcel Bronmans and Javier Perez Tasso. In our lunchtime panel discussions, we'll drill down into the detail of a single payments platform and we'll also look at compliance, putting counter terrorism funding under the spotlight. But first, earlier today, for the latest interview in our Cybos Game Changer series, I spoke to Bruce Weber about the transformation in graduate recruitment in the banking industry. With me is Bruce Weber, Dean and Professor of Business Administration at the Lerner College of Business and Economics at the University of Delaware. Now, Bruce is one of the few academics to be studying the changing relationship between banks and graduates. He has observed a change in what banks are looking for in graduates and in what graduates are looking for from their employers. Bruce, welcome. So let me start off by asking you, what are banks looking for in graduates? Yeah. Well, I think banks are looking for the same things they were looking for in the past, but I think there's a much higher premium now on agility and self-awareness, which means being able to, to flex yourself in work and also being aware of where your strengths and weaknesses lie. Uh, millennials uh, are really good on the former, not so good on the self-awareness dimension. Okay, so if I ask you what uh, graduates looking for in banks, then there's a bit of a mismatch? I think there is a mismatch, Steve. Uh, they are coming into the workforce with a different uh, style of education than previous generations had. I think they're very used to being interactive. They're very used to being uh, communicated to with technology and I think that means change for the way the managers need to work with the millennial generation. Okay, let's get into the details. So if I were asked to, uh, if you could pick the top three areas mm -hmm. of concern for banks in terms of hiring or filling that talent pipeline, what mm -hmm. would they be? Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the banks need to understand that the millennial workforce wants to be engaged in meaningful work. And what I mean by that is they need to know that I'm contributing to something that I understand, I can observe, and I can uh, feel positive about it. If you take that away, the millennial generation will be far less motivated than maybe previous generations where simply having a job was, was the goal. Uh, I think that's what uh, the managers need to be aware of. I think there's another aspect, too, that the, um, the millennial of today is less concerned about uh, what's my title? Uh, where is my office? Uh, they really want skills-driven mobility. They want to be able to be placed in the organization based on their skills and their delivery. So I think it, it, it's, it's kind of a two-sided coin for bank management mm -hmm. today. So it's a bit challenging. So it sounds like they're coming to a job wanting more than just a job. They want it to be meaningful. It has to fit their work-life balance. They're not just striving to have the corner office. Exactly. I think the, uh, the, the things that were considered trophies in the past, those aren't so meaningful today. Um, but I think what you do see with, with the, uh, the generation of today, and when I say millennials, I'm talking about people that are between 16, 17 years old and, and 35. So that really is the largest part of the U.S workforce mm -hmm. right now, at least. Um, and I think what they do bring to the workplace, though, is tremendous agility, flexibility. I think customer orientation comes to them quite naturally. I think where they uh, sometimes struggle is sort of self-awareness. How do I work within my team? How do I work across the organization? Um, but that kind of uh, uh, training uh, can, can enable this generation to, to still succeed and do phenomenally well. I just thought it's funny you mentioned self-awareness because they're so self-aware and that sense on social media. <laughs> Everything's shared online, but yet at the same time, you feel they, they sometimes don't know their, their own boundaries and perhaps uh, uh, what they should and should not. I mean, it almost makes yeah. me feel that uh, the access to management, for example, they yeah. feel it should be my friend, not my boss. <laughs> yes, Steve. Um, Self-absorbed and self-aware are not the same thing. <laughs> so I agree with you on the first. Self-aware is being able to understand what your workplace motivations and behaviors are. There's lots of nice ways to find out in about a half a day what motivates you as an individual. And within a, within a, a group of millennials, you will find very different motivators and very different workplace behaviors. And understanding what those are early on in a millennial's career is important. So I think as organizations bring the millennial generation and give them more responsibility, there also has to be that effort to get this, get the, the newly hired graduate to have that self-awareness so they know, you know, if I'm somebody that needs to be exactly right all the time, which is a very common 
personality characteristics, especially in the technology area, you need to let them know that a deadline is a deadline. You might need a few more facts to make you comfortable and feel right. like I'm right, but a lot of times the organization needs to be close to being certain that you're right, not absolutely certain. So what would you recommend to organizations who are looking to hire and fill this talent pipeline? What should they do? Yeah. The, the, the simple ways of, of getting the self-awareness level up is, is things like predictive index, Berkman tests. Uh, those are pretty straightforward. Um, I think on the management side, so when you come up to you know, my generation, people in the 50s, I think it's getting used to, to much more of a continuous feedback loop. I think I got used to appraisals every six months, mm -hmm. sometimes even a year. That's, that's too long. In today's generation with an agile workforce, you need to be back and forth with your team members with assessment, real clear feedback, positive or negative, probably on a weekly basis, if not weekly, every two or three weeks. Well, that sounds quite intensive because as you mentioned, the appraisals used to come once a year, but a weekly basis? I would recommend striving for weekly. If you can't hit weekly, do it every two weeks. Is it also a lack of uh, uh, patience, perhaps, on the part of the, the younger generation? Do they want to perhaps get further faster, or do they just need to know exactly where it is they're at and where they're going? Yeah, I, I think there's two dimensions. Um, I think impatience will show up in the millennial generation when they don't know clearly what the objective is. What am I contributing to is very important to this generation. So if, even if they're working on a very narrow task in a large project team, what is the overall goal here? What are we trying to achieve? And my generation, maybe the attitude was, well, just get on with it. You know, get your part of the, the project done really well and things will be fine. Today's generation needs a little more motivation than that. I think they really need to see where's the big ship heading. So they need to have meaningful employment? Must they believe in their job, are you saying? I think they need to believe in what they're contributing to. Uh, I found, you know, the people that are that are coming out with sort of a solid business and technology background, you know, they understand, the, you know, the size and the scale of some of the large global financial organizations today, 300,000, 400,000 people in some of the biggest banks. They know that their role within that is not going to be, uh, you know, uh, at, at the, the, the bridge of the ship, but they do want to know, where are we going? What am I contributing to? Mm -hmm. Well, this is not a problem that is unique just to the finance industry. I think it's across all platforms. Forms. You know, I, I was sharing with you how I heard of a story of a friend who had gone on a business trip with a new employee and she said, I got to come back a few days earlier to celebrate my three week anniversary with my boyfriend. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, if your 25th wedding anniversary, I think people say, okay, you know, but yeah. so is that a, 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 perhaps a signal to employers that they need to change their attitudes and their approach? We can't expect them to change for us, we need to change for them. Yeah, I think it all comes back to kind of good old fashioned communication. Uh, if you're on a business trip, I think the priorities around what the what the business needs, uh, if they're communicated clearly, maybe leaving early is, is okay under some circumstances, maybe in other circumstances not. But I think once management communicates, once you work with your team to really let them know what's critical, what's a nice to have, and what we can be flexible on. Uh, I think the, the current generation of graduates, they'll deliver you just have to be clear about what the priorities are. It also means a lot of time invested on the part of the, the leader, the team leader, the management, because each individual needs all that communication. Is that investment worthwhile? Because at the same time, they may jump shit for <laughs> a few hundred dollars more to another job. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, well, I, I always like this analogy of seeds and soil, right? You can have fantastic seeds, but if the soil's not fertile, if you're not watering it, fertilizing it, taking care, um, those, those you know, millennial workers that you hired with terrific training will not thrive in your organization. They'll move on. It's up to the manager to make that environment cultivating for the, for the millennial worker and really bring them along towards where they're going to play more and more leadership roles. Mm -hmm. But they may get a bit frustrated. The manager said, last two, I spent six months working on the guy and he up and left just when he was ready to take on the job by himself. Is it worth the investment? That's what they're asking. Uh, I, I believe it is. I mean, I think any organization that does a good job bringing in graduates and developing their capabilities on site gets a reward from that. You won't have 100% retention. I wouldn't anticipate that. But you really should be capable of keeping the majority of your, your uh, hired graduates for a length of time where they're really going to have made solid contributions within their organizations. What is the length of time? In the past, again, we talked about an iron rice bowl. 
the same job for the rest of your life. Yeah. That is no longer a reality. No, anymore. that's gone. And like yeah. I said before, skills-based promotion is really what the millennial generation looks for. It's not the title, it's what have I developed, what have I contributed to. I think the, the time frame really depends on the organization. They have to think hard about when do you begin to become a contributor in an organization? What's the, what's the training time frame? What's the learning time frame? I think in an organization where they can bring along new talent, if somebody stays three or four years, you should be able to see value from that. Uh, this is a generation that's going to want to move to different parts of the world. They're going to want to go on to maybe graduate education, do an MBA. Uh, and I think you need to be flexible and prepared for that. But at the same time, if the soil's fertile, you're going to keep the stars you're going to keep the talent that you need. So it almost means as a, an employer, I'm also thinking, I know this guy may not stay for more than two years. Should I go in with a different expectation as well? Mm. Well, I'm a dean of a business school that has 200 faculty members. Uh, I sometimes lose my best faculty, but I'm always looking for another one to come in and join us. So I don't think it's any different in the business world. Very talented people are mobile. You've got to create an environment for them and a, 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 a series of responsibility and tasks and, and a level of communication that they want to stay. Let's flip sides now and talk about what young people should have in mind when they're looking for employment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're saying how organizations need to change. Should they change? Should their attitudes and approach towards employment change? They have to listen. You know, I quipped about uh, being self-absorbed, and I think the, the biggest uh, uh, skill that any young person joining the workforce can have is to listen. Talk to the people in the organization, both laterally as well as vertically. You know, it's not just about managing your manager. I think it's about knowing everybody else on the team, what people are contributing to, understanding what pressures your manager is under. It's possible that you've got an organization that's quite flat. Your manager may be in touch with the C-suite, you know, very early on in your career. What's the pressure on that person? What are they being tasked with? And how are you contributing to that person's success? That's sort of the, the things that I think new graduates don't grasp when they arrive on the job. But I think the ones that are clever and really understand how a large uh, technology or financial organization works, they'll, they'll learn that fairly quickly. As you mentioned, you know, with the university that you've come across many students, perhaps you can share with us some examples of, you know, th what's worked for the students mm -hmm. or, or stories. I'm sure they come back and said, hey, you know, I went for this job interview, didn't work out, or I got this one because I did this. Yeah. Can you yep. share something with us? Well, I think the key today is internships and mentorships for the younger people. So what I'm finding is we've got students that are still two years away from graduating that have already had an internship and are beginning to figure out things like fit and whether their skills match up with what the organization needs. So what I find our students do really well today is getting a sense from an internship or from a mentorship arrangement where maybe they're talking to somebody who's an alumni of our college mm -hmm. about their work and visiting them in the office. Um, what they feel will motivate them, what they feel is the right environment from them. And I find the ones that have done an internship, uh, like the organization, go back and join them on a permanent basis, you find out three or four years later, they're much further ahead than you would have expected because they made a conscientious choice, not just based on the brand name of the organization, but I had a great summer there, like my manager, like my work, I wanted to go for it permanently, and they stay on and do really well. But you see, that sounds really different, as you're mentioning it. I mean, how in your generation, or even my generation, I, I didn't have to like my boss. No. You know, I just went to work and said, hey, you know, I'm here, it's a job, I'll do it, you know. Uh, uh, but that relationship seems to have changed. And how much of that will affect the way the workforce moves forward and mm -hmm. industries as well? Because now they're having to say, I have to... Well, not mostly coddle, but I mean, you know, yeah. be a bit nice to my guy or he may leave me in a lurch, you know. Uh, yeah. But that was always a good thing to do even when we were, you know, recent graduates, Steve. Uh, yeah. I think it's just imperative now. I think it went from being a nice to have to being a requirement. And I think the, the, the leaders of today's organizations know that this generation coming out, 20 somethings, uh, really brings a lot to the table if they're managed in the, pro in the correct way. And I think that just means some of the old rules need to be changed. Um, and I think some of the communications that we you know, may have seen as adequate, it's mm -hmm. not adequate today. You know, this is a generation that's sending hundreds and hundreds of texts every day with yeah. their friends. And if you're only in, in, their, uh, you know, in there talking to them every six months, that's just inadequate. You've got to have a much tighter feedback loop today. But maybe each of those communications is a lot shorter than we may have gotten used to ourselves. So very quickly, top two tips for organizations out there. Banks, what should they do in 
or can they do in the immediate future? Yeah, well, it's a talent pipeline. So I say go back into the food chain even further, meaning you might want to start offering internships to students that are finishing their first or second year of university rather than waiting until they're about to graduate or their final summer. Um, Forming partnerships with higher education institutions is also excellent. We've had a very strong relationship, a collaboration with J.P. Morgan Chase. They're very big in Delaware, doing a lot of their back office and processing. They hire hundreds of our students into their operations group every year. So I think the, the, the two lessons really are partner with the educational institutions where you're finding the best talent, and once that talent comes on site, they're part of your team, step up that communication flow. That feedback loop has got to be really tight today, and it's got to be really clear to a graduate. What am I contributing to? How am I doing? If you tick off those two boxes, you're going to be in a strong position. Okay, so I guess organizations, as you say, have to hit back to school in a way. <laughs> they need to learn. They need All right, to learn. thanks yes. a lot, Bruce. Okay, Steve, thanks so much. my pleasure. Bruce Weber from the University of Delaware speaking to me a little bit earlier, and you can catch Bruce discussing those issues further at a session called New Dynamics of the FinTech Talent Pipeline. That's on the Swift stand tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m. I thought it was a fantastic interview, actually, so that'd be a great session tomorrow. Well, let's look ahead now and talk about this afternoon's fast-approaching session on cybersecurity catching the bad guys. And to help us do that, we're now joined in the studio by Marcel Bromans, who's the Chief Operations Officer at Swift. And Javier Perez Tasso, Swift's chief executive for the Americas and the UK region, who I'll be speaking to in a moment. And Marcel, if I can start with you first of all. Now, cybersecurity is incredibly high up on the industry's agenda this year. Can you tell us the reason why there's been a shift towards this? Well, it's true that uh, it's actually always been high on the agenda at uh, Cybos also, uh, because uh, Swift has always been active, of course, in cybersecurity, and there's always been a, an issue. But it's also true that in the industry in general, across industries, in fact, uh, cybersecurity, of course, we see a lot of uh, spectacular uh, attacks and hacks uh, in uh, all kinds of institutions. And in the financial industry specifically, we've seen a couple of uh, compromises of uh, our customers' uh, IT environments that actually then led to fraudulent messages being sent. And that really is, of course, quite a, 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 an issue that has been brought the whole topic high on the agendas of the business, of uh, boards, of uh, CEOs, CIOs, uh, uh, and when something is big in the industry, of course, uh, we want to have it also big at Cybos, and uh, that's, I think, why we see uh, on Cybos specifically the plenary, many sessions, big issue debates on cyber. And that messaging and, and SWIFT go hand in hand, so hence why it's an incredibly important discussion. Right. But I get the impression it still falls on operation teams to keep the industry safe day to day. So what do you see as the main operational challenges for financial institutions operating right. in this environment? Right. Well, it's indeed key that actually it becomes everybody's issue. I mean, uh, an entire company, you, know, you need a security-minded culture, you have as many eyes and ears as you have uh, personnel in a company. And you need a, a good security culture. The, the, the tools to protect you and everything is definitely not enough. You need to be quite paranoid, actually. The paranoid will succeed in this field because you need to really assume it's going to happen to you. And to, in order to be protect, protected against that, you really need to invest much more into detection and response that when it happens, and not just assume it does not happen, when it happens, you're actually going to be ready for it. And you can really draw a parallel to uh, protecting your own house. Uh, your, locking your doors is not good enough. Then you install an alarm system because you assume the locks can be broken by somebody that wants to come inside. And then you want your alarm system to go off. You detect it and you can respond. And it's exactly the same in uh, cyber. And of course, it's a bit more complex. It's not one alarm system. You need many alarm systems. You need great people, you need a security culture, uh, so you need many things to be right, get your basics right, and focus on detection and response. So it's a nice analogy, actually, with the alarms. But we talked about the operation teams being hugely responsible. There seems to be a lot of weight on their shoulders. So who else should be responsible for it? Well, like I said, it's really across the board. Uh, sec a security intrusion a compromise can start with one email to somebody in a business department of a, of a bank, 
of any company. Uh, so you need to start with the awareness there. And of course, behind the scenes, so operations, uh, the technical operation is usually a bit behind the scenes. There are the, the people that are watching these alarm systems that need to be ready to react. You need good people there. It's not enough to just depend on your tools that raise an alarm. You need people who actually go actively into your systems, are suspicious, and are always on the watch out for these kind of things. So but responsibility is right across the board, are you saying? Absolutely, yeah. very important. And what kind of action should in institutions take if they actually suspect fraud? Well, it starts even before that. What we like from our customers also is that when there is a suspicion of a compromise or there is a compromise of their environment or they suspect something, we want to know because then you can react. You can only react if you know something. So uh, we can draw the an analogy again with the, the house because if you get the, your neighbors get broken into, it would be nice that you know and you know how that went, so you can protect yourself better. Now, so information sharing is, sounds fantastic, but how much do you think the industry is going to do that? They, you know, there's sharing of ideas here at right. Cybus, but you want to encourage that culture right. of sharing because right. the information sharing of messaging has to be fast and quick, hasn't it? Absolutely. The time is critical, indeed, and completeness of the information. So it is difficult, absolutely. But we are making great strides with our customers. To, it starts also with awareness. It starts with awareness that, well, can you do some, that you can do something with that kind of information and that you should not keep it to yourself, but in fact you should share. And of course there Swift, we play a, an important role to be a trusted uh, party who can take that information, turn it into actionable uh, information for our entire community uh, in, a, in a good way, in an anonymous way, uh, and that can be very, very well used and we're getting very good feedback already on, on what we actually do in this space. So it works and that people need to realize. Thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you. And time now to turn to Marcel's uh, colleague at Swift, Javier Pereftaso, one of the executive sponsors of Swift's customer security program. Javier, first let me ask you, tell us a bit more about the program. Well, uh, actually as Marcel, Marcel just referred, in the modus operandi, um, the starting point uh, was uh, was that the, the local um, environment of the customers was compromised. And um, because through that, uh, attackers managed to steal valid operator credentials and use those credentials to input fraudulent transactions uh, that look legitimate, uh, while at the same time obfuscating all the evidence through malware. So what is positive is that customers are increasingly aware and uh, they're taking action. But we want to be also part of the solution and we want to help them in their efforts to prevent and detect fraud and that's where the customer security program actually fits in. Mm -hmm. And what are the areas that the program covers? Well there are essentially uh, three main areas, we've been talking uh, about it uh, uh, since yesterday uh, throughout the conference and it was discussed in the opening plenary. The first one is that, um, that's crucial, it all starts with the customers themselves. Uh, they need to secure and protect their local environment and to that end, we're introducing a series of uh, uh, controls um, that uh, together with, I mean, they, they need to uh, ensure that uh, they, they comply with these controls and we'll be introducing a, an assurance framework to ensure compliance. And this assurance framework will be a combination actually of self-attestation with sample inspections. The second area is that, of course, these customers do not operate in a vacuum. Uh, they are here to do business. We have 11,000 plus customers in the Swift ecosystem. Uh, so the second area is about their relationship with their counterparts. Uh, and uh, in there, they can have hundreds or even uh, thousands of counterparts. And as Marcel said, uh, in cyber, only the paranoid survive. Uh, so you need to be prepared for the worst. And the worst case scenarios, of course, is that you are breached or one of your counterparties breached. And that's where fraud prevention and detection is paramount. Mm -hmm. And the third area, and Marcel also touched upon it, uh, is that every customer of the Swift community has a role to play uh, and a responsibility in the Swift ecosystem. And, and it's basically that they need to share information, mm -hmm. any suspect uh, activity that they, they may have uh, found out or they need to alert us if anything goes wrong. And at the same time, uh, they need to act on, uh, on the, the information that we share back to the community. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, three main areas. It's about, their cost, it's about protecting and securing their customer environment. It's about preventing and detecting fraud in their relationship with counterparts. And it's about sharing and preparing um, 
uh, with the whole right. Swifter community. And I think the sharing bit is important because it allows you to also uh, then plug the holes if there are any to, to better enforce the system. But what are the next steps you will be discussing with customers while here at Cybos? Well, uh, there are different areas. I mean, one, one, uh, one, one of the important ones is obviously we'll be, we'll be introducing this series of security controls. Um, and uh, actually, we had this morning a, a press release about it. We'll publish a press release about it. And uh, we'll uh, now launch shortly a customer validation on the implementation of these controls before these become uh, applicable for the whole industry as of 2017. Another important area is, um, of course, how to leverage uh, data analytics uh, in helping our customers fight fraud. Um, we've recently announced there as well that uh, we'll be providing daily validation reports, which is uh, an effective way uh, for customers to um, uh, detect unusual behavior by comparing uh, their transactions on their own premises mm -hmm. with their own records at Swift. Um, and in the fraud prevention uh, space, obviously, it's crucial that they keep on monitoring their RMA relationships. Mm. And maybe to end, um, uh, while cyber is clearly high on the agenda, uh, we've heard it from uh, Gottfried, our CEO, yesterday in the opening plenary. Um, the world doesn't stand still on uh, new technologies, mm -hmm. on innovation, uh, and for that matter, on our Swift 2020 strategy. And one very good example is uh, Swift GPI, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, together with this strong customer security program at the edge and uh, our evolving financial crime compliance portfolio of sanctions, KYC, and AML is going to bring, it's going to create um, uh, a new, uh, more efficient, uh, more transparent, more secure, yeah. and more compliant cross-border payments uh, space. And essentially, it's going to drive, it's going to move correspondent right. banking yet to a different level. That's fantastic. So you're helping uh, com companies grow with the more access, you know, transparency, but at the same time keeping them safe as well. So that's, that's very important. Crucial. So gentlemen, thanks so much. It sounds like there is a, one key message you both agree on, and that's a call to all institutions to secure their local environment with Swift's help, of course. Uh, Marcel, Javier, thank you both. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Well, let's take a break from business for the moment. And this city of clock and watchmakers, I've been turning back the hands of time with a journey through Geneva's Old Town. A great place for a stroll in Geneva is the Old Town. It's an ancient maze of small streets and picturesque squares filled with great places to eat and historical sites. At the heart of the Old Town is the Cathedral of St. Pierre. 157 steps up its main tower gets you superb views of the lake with his jet doe fountain. Back at ground level, small bars, cafes and antique shops lie in its winding cobbled streets, narrow passages and hidden courtyards. Geneva's worldwide reputation for watchmaking can be seen everywhere, even in the flora. The parks and public squares are where the locals come to relax and play. Today, Geneva is home to more international organizations than any other city, building on its reputation for civility, stability, and charm. Okay, it's time for us to talk single payments platform, an idea being discussed in response to the real-time payments, which is a move to a single multi-functional platform for all payments. Is it the way forward? 
And here to discuss the pros and cons, we have a very distinguished panel. We're joined by Lisa Lansdowne Higgins, who's Vice President of Card Operations at the Royal Bank of Canada. Tony Brady, who's Head of Global Product Management of BMY Mellon Treasury Services. And last but not least, we have Mark Bale, the General Director of Mark Infrastructures and Payments at the European Central Bank. Welcome to you all. Thank Welcome. You. A truly international and well-versed pool of wisdom here with us. But Lisa, I'm going to start off with you. Let's start, perhaps you can help us understand what is a single payments platform looking like? Well, I think as people envision it, it is a single platform that allows the processing of all payment transactions where they will be faster, uh, more immediate, and efficient from a cost perspective. I think that's what the different jurisdictions are imagining today to try to design uh, what modernization might look like in our different countries. Mm -hmm. And Mark, could this also include high-value payments and securities transactions? Yes, indeed. A uh, single platform can mean also payment for different purposes, uh, so retail, uh, wholesale, but also securities transactions in central bank money. So the, the fact of single platforms and single technologies more than platforms is very important. Uh, the, the use of standardized messaging like ISO 20 or 22, for instance, across the board is very important. It helps to rationalize the way the banks can issue transactions, payments, should it be for security purposes or for plain payments. So it means a lot to have this single strategy, really to, to rationalize the way we can access platforms and the strengths also we can put into the resilience of those platforms. Mm -hmm. So for Europe, it's a, it's a big challenge ahead and a very interesting one. Yeah, it's try, trying to get everyone to speak the same language so you can do business more easily. Well, Tony, what is the bank looking for as a client of market infrastructures? Yeah, so that is uh, that continues to evolve as we focus on what we believe the global payment experience of our client should be for the future. Um, so I'm sure there'll be more requests to come, but I think some initial uh, requests have been uh, of certain market infrastructures to include a unique transaction identifier that we can use to provide end-to-end -end payment status information to our clients, which does not exist today. Uh, a second request uh, that has uh, been made in certain, certain jurisdictions is to lengthen the day of processing, in some cases go 24-7. But I think those are just the initial requests. I think the, you know, the financial institution community needs to work together to define what is that global real-time payment experience we want to deliver to clients and then identify what's the best way to get there. And Mark and Lisa were, were nodding away with you there. So just moving it on, what problem is the single platform actually solving? If I could bring you in, Mark. Well, I think it's, it does not solve a problem. It, it helps the market to be more efficient. So to bring greater efficiency, greater efficiency, I mean, economically, because you can have the same technology reused for different purposes, mm -hmm. and economy, uh, efficiently also in terms of operations. So being quicker to move liquidity where you need it so that you can really do the best usage of your capacity to pay and capacity to, to, uh, yeah, to settle. Well, and Lisa, is it about mm -hmm. cutting costs? Yeah. Well, I, I think costs are always top of mm -hmm. agenda. Uh, myself being in operations for a very long time, it, it sent, tends to be the things that we will always focus on and reimagine. But I would also say, too, it's about uh, looking at how we become more inclusive. So if you have single infrastructure or if you're working towards that, how can you bring in some more new innovative ideas and, and adopt in new uh, players that aren't traditionally in the market today? I think that those are some of the principles as well that, that mm -hmm. we're focusing on. But will there be any uh, resilience issues? Because you're, you're sort of putting all your eggs in one basket. Well, I think resiliency is top of the agenda. If we think about what are some of the challenges and barriers, I think resiliency is first and foremost from a risk perspective, the thing that you have to actually be able to solve for. And ultimately, will it imagine and be one technology? And I'm not sure that it ultimately will be, mm -hmm. because I think if we take a look at legacy and we look at how it is that we're going to build our infrastructure together, it's how it is that we deliver something along those lines that drives us to cost efficiency as well as innovation, and I think those are top of the agenda, especially right. when we keep the client experience front and center. So but cost efficiency and yeah. innovation I, I pretty let Tony, because he yeah. looked like he wanted to jump in. Yeah, I, you know, I think when we talk about a single payment platform, it implies that, you know, globally we're going to end up with one 
piece of software that will magically solve all our problems. I don't think that is uh, practical or reasonable. I think uh, you know what the banking community is working on, and Swift GPI is a great example of it, is we want to create a global real-time payment experience. And I think um, the, the answer is probably to stitch together some of the legacy architecture we already have, but also weave in some of the, uh, the new payment systems that are being developed. So for example, Swift GPI is, is a, a great example where we're taking an existing technology, building new capability on top of it to deliver a, a better experience to our clients, but in addition to that, you've got at least 24 countries around the world developing a real-time payment system. They're all developing against ISO 20022. There's no reason why we can't work toward interoperating those uh, real-time payment systems to stitch together that, that client experience globally that I think our clients deserve. Right. They de definitely do deserve, don't they? Let's have a look at the main challenges. And Mark, if I can bring you in. What are the main challenges to actually realizing this single platform? Uh, there's <laughs> many of them. I mean, we need to... Uh, as just said uh, by Stephen, uh, we need to bring together all the actors to agree on using the same technology with the same harmonized practices. So harmonization, standardization is a base, so we have a standard that we can use, ISO 20022, mm -hmm. but based on that you need to really develop uh, harmonized practices. So it is a dialogue within your market, within your region, but also a global dialogue. So we are trying to have those multiple dialogue possible so that we converge towards the same use of the same standards. And that's a challenge I think today. So it's not anymore so much a technological challenge because the IT is there, the, the technology is there more or less, but it's really a dialogue to make sure, you were saying it earlier I think, mm -hmm. that we are discussing about the same thing. So the use of the same identifier, we do a lot of work, I mean we did the work on LEI, we are now doing work on UTI and UPI, so unique transaction identifier, unique product identifier, so that we can uh, identify also the objects in the same way globally. But uh, to come there, that's a challenge today. Lisa? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think the one thing I would add there is that as we look forward and we think about what's on the horizon, especially in technology, there's new technologies being introduced every day that will help to solve some of these problems or at least allow us an opportunity to build upon them. So when I think of unique identifiers and I think of all of the legacy infrastructure and current payment existing rails that, uh, that we have, it's how do you bring them together? And when you can, and it makes sense from a business case perspective, based on investment and the right dollars and the client experience, it's then how do you then look to replace those and bring that consistency and that standardization into play. And Tony, yeah. I know you want to say something <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, so you know, like many organizations, we have many initiatives to choose from um, to try to you know, use emerging technology to build our future. And we've uh, tried to define what we think the key ingredients are for any of these initiatives to be successful, and we've settled on three. The first is standards. You need standards so that the communi uh, community can operate with one another. The second is network effect, right? So you need a critical mass of players in any market uh, playing with one another, in this case, the global payments uh, infrastructure and ecosystem. So you need that critical mass in order for anything to really take hold. The third that we haven't really talked about yet is regulatory engagement. So you have a variety of regulatory regimes around the world. If we're going to stitch together this real-time global payment experience, we've got to figure out how to harmonize that regulatory engagement and make sure that the product we're delivering at the end is one the regulators are comfortable with. And you say figure yes. out, who's going to be tasked with that? Who can you bring to the table to sort that out? Yeah, so I, I would say SWIFT is going to be tremendously helpful here, uh, leading the GPI initiative. They're now up to 86 banks, and so among that community, you've got uh, tremendous credibility with regulators. In addition, the real-time payment systems that are being brought up in, in various countries across the world, that's being done in collaboration with their local regulators. So as we think about interop interoperating those various real-time payment systems, I think those real-time payment systems and, and the operators of those can be very helpful to figure out how to make that happen in a way the regulators are comfortable with. Do you think regulators should be uh, more critical in this role in, in sort of pushing 
uh, the organizations in the right direction so that it's easier for, I mean, we're talking countries all over the world having to speak the same language, so to speak, and which is really challenging. Whereas if they agree to in each region, for instance, to kind of take on the same, jump on the same boat, I mean. Oh, no, yes. I mean, we should not go too far at the same time, too yeah. quick. I think uh, we need to take the pace necessary to get there. So it's good that there is initiative coming from the industry and uh, we, we are behind this. I mean, we, we support this. At the same time, we do a lot of work already between central banks, to the, for instance, uh, with the CPMI and the G20 uh, central banks meeting around and trying to discuss how much uh, we can harmonize practices and uh, in this particular context have a co I mean, coordinated approach to, mm -hmm. uh, to regulation uh, there. So it is important uh, to, uh, to see that there is groups and we are working on that, but it's, uh, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And in terms of cross border, so beyond those domestic borders uh, for Tony, um, how can you take this beyond domestic borders? Yeah, so first I think you need, um, you know, in, in terms of real time payment systems, you need credible real time payment systems nationally that you know are uh, ubiquitous. So within the United States, for example, one of the things that we're working on with re the real time system we're bringing up early next year is. We've got to be able to reach the entire deposit base of the U.S. So that's certainly something that we've got to demonstrate that we can do before we try to go too far to take it cross border. But I think another thing that we've got to focus on early on as we develop these systems is real time fraud analysis. Mm -hmm. Right. Because essentially what we're doing is we're speeding up the movement, the flow of funds. And yet there have been some very visible challenges with fraud. So one of the things we're, we're trying to demonstrate, I think, at the national level is that we can use real-time fraud analysis to detect and prevent fraud. Once at the national level those things are in place, then I think it's easier to reach across borders and begin to interoperate these systems in a way that is both safe, sound, and meets the needs of our clients. Right. And I think you've got great best practice from the telecommunications industry as well. So are you looking to the industry to learn best practice, and, and do you think you can replicate what they're doing in your space? Yeah, so I think what the telecommunications industry has done really well uh, that necessarily wasn't a strength of the financial institution community was that I believe they really started with the client experience in mind. So when I land at an airport in a foreign country, you know, I'm a, a customer of a wireless uh, company in the U.S. I sign up for a very simple, you know, travel pass. I land in a foreign country, and before the wheels stop on the plane, I can call, text, or video anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, they've had to coordinate an awful lot in the background to give me that experience. I think that's what the financial institutions now need to do. Start with that global real-time experience we want to deliver to clients, and then we'll, in the background, figure out how to weave together our systems to make it happen. Yeah, so we're still talking about harmonization in a way. We are. <laughs> that's the big question. Well, Lisa, you will be moderating a session tomorrow all about this topic. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I, I think tomorrow's going to be a great conversation. If you just look at our conversation we've had here, the dynamics right. that go across from a global perspective and the dynamics that we bring uh, from best practices in each of our own jurisdictions in our countries. If you even now, uh, I'll speak to the telecommunications. It's so funny that when we look at how we're going to re-engineer and reimagine this, the realities are we do extend. It's one of the things that we do in the financial community. We extend into other industries. Where are their best practices and how do we leverage it? But also working with our regulators. What is that journey going to look like and how can we empower that? And I think tomorrow, looking at the panelists that we have, mm -hmm. that's really going to bring the dynamics to the conversation. I'm and sure. it's been a great taste, hasn't yes, it? Yes. A, a preview of what we can expect uh, tomorrow. Only a tip of the iceberg that yeah. we want to talk about. Thank you all for coming <laughs> Thank in. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back to discuss uh, counter-terrorism financing just after this message. Sanction screening from SWIFT. Fully managed, ready to use, no hardware or software to implement. Sanction screening combines a highly sophisticated screening engine with regular list updates. Rigorously checking external sanctions lists. Private lists that can be securely maintained by the user. Sanction screening screens all transaction formats and provides permission-based access and extensive reporting. An independent quality assurance report that gives you peace of mind that the optimum level of effectiveness and performance is maintained. Simple and real-time. Hosted and cost-effective. So, the numbers. Over 500 clients in 140 countries. 
36 global sanctions lists, exhaustively checked for quality when updated. The Swift hosted transaction screening solution, reducing your time and cost to compliance. Peace of mind. Sanctions screening from Swift. Now, counter-terrorism financing is rarely out of the spotlight. Regulators are increasing the pressure on banks to adapt their procedures to monitor and indeed block transactions. And while governments around the world are relaxing sanctions against some countries, such as Iran and Cuba, they still apply sectorial sanctions against companies and individuals, particularly across Russia. Just some of the challenges at hand. Well, let's talk more about the issues here. On the panel, we have Tom Keating, who's the director of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI. Also here, Joel Lang, who's the managing director of Dow Jones Risk and Compliance. And Jim Fries, chief compliance officer at Deutsche Börse Group. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome, gentlemen. Tom, let me start off with you. Give us an overview of where you see the sanctions landscape today. Highly complicated. Um, Gone are the days of uh, simply them and, them and us. We have sectorial sanctions, as you mentioned, in Russia. We have sub-state mm -hmm. sanctions. We have mm -hmm. sanctions coming off in Iran, uh, which obviously are difficult to interpret. Um, so it, highly complex, and I think probably only going to get more complicated as nations use sanctions uh, as a foreign policy tool. And Jim, where do you think regulators will focus their actions and efforts in the next year or two? So what regulators are looking for is first an aspect of the banks knowing the risk and making decisions on that. So actually accepting policies and particularly when we're here in such a global environment at Cybos, the struggle is for banks to have a global policy faced with the different constraints and the different expectations in the jurisdictions as Tom was saying. And how realistic is that? It's a one-way street. Um, frankly, though, in some ways it's easier for a bank to say, we're going to set our standard at such a level, usually above any individual minima, that's certainly easier than trying to juggle back and forth between the different jurisdictions or customers. Well, Joel, sanctions, particularly on Iran, have been relaxed but not removed altogether. Uh, in such circumstances, how can banks more effectively manage the re-risking of their business flows and correspondent networks? Well, I think the key is uh, jurisdictions. And so where is the bank based? Does it have a nexus in the US? Uh, if so, uh, re-risking to Iran is, is simply not going to be possible. Um, it, there has to be a clear review with the chief legal officer to review whether that is a, a, a possibility. And um, those banks that have less of a US nexus that are focused primarily in Europe or primarily focused in the Middle East or other parts of the world, uh, we'll have those opportunities. Um, and then the challenge is to ensure that they are not tripping over any of the U.S. sanctions in any of their bilateral mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And Tom, we've mentioned Russia very briefly, so we've got to be careful, but it does bring its own special challenges, doesn't it? I'm being euphemistic for banks. So particularly with sectorial sanction application. So could you give us a brief explanation what sectorial sanctions are and also their implication for banks? Yeah, so what, uh, what the authorities in the US and the, and the EU have decided to do is rather than say we will sanction Russia, uh, to say okay we're going to, we're going to focus on particular industries and to some extent particular forms of business within those industries. So deep water drilling is for example uh, the example that the oil industry, uh, that affects the oil industry. And so that really requires banks to not just rely on the lists that they get from the different providers, uh, they've actually got to do very detailed analysis of, well, you know, what form of funding are we providing? Uh, what uh, term are we providing? Because there are also term limits on, uh, on finance that can be provided. So it's very, very complex. And actually, arguably, as we make sanctions more complicated and more targeted, do banks simply say, you know what, it's too complicated, I just won't do business with the oil sector in Russia, full stop. Um, so there is a risk that by making sanctions smarter, uh, we, make them, we make perhaps the application of them by those empowered to apply them, the banks and others, dumber. So in, in some sense, by de-risking, you're actually excluding some financial targeting on certain countries or sectors where you wouldn't have otherwise. Well, so there's no doubt that people and organisations suffer as a result of sanctions when they shouldn't do. So banks will take a global policy, uh, we, will, we will continue not to deal with Iran. OK, well, but you're allowed to deal with Iran. Uh, why are you not continuing, why are you not starting to deal with Iran again? It's too complicated. 
therefore we'll continue as, it, as we were. We won't work with Iran at the moment. Yeah, do you guys agree? Because again, the, the policy in the US would differ from that in the EU mm. and elsewhere in the world, so uh, do you just decide it's really not worth the hassle? Well, well it also has to make commercial sense. Right. Obviously, when we're talking about correspondent banking activity, the revenue from that is very limited. It has massive flows in terms of volume or trade finance, et cetera. But for the bank to really say, we want to do that, but at the same level, have the additional monitoring controls to do that, that's also a commercial proposition. It's not just a simple compliance issue. And for you? Yeah, and, and, and I think it's also about being confident that you can demonstrate to the regulator that you've done the research necessary. As Tom mentioned, it's a very much industry-based, so it's looking at those sectoral sanctions, how they apply to your business, and then also not just looking at the list, but also looking at the guidance from OFAC and from the EU about those entities that are owned and controlled uh, by the list entities and being confident that the research you're doing into companies to identify uh, ownership uh, is robust. But those companies that are multinationals that are looking to guidance maybe from the EU that varies, as yeah. you were saying, from America, it's a bit of a confusing picture. So what do you do in this situation? Tom. So companies will approach their you know, HM Treasury or OFAC or whatever and ask for licenses to operate and so on. But it, it's just extremely challenging to navigate through a jungle where there are an awful lot of kind of competing uh, pressures. So the world was much simpler you know, in the <laughs> 1980s when you had you know, them and us, if, if you like, and sanctions were applied uh, with a certain amount of brute force. Now, as I said before, we're trying to be smart with sanctions. That's the right thing to do. We don't want to uh, unnecessarily sanction companies or populations. But we've almost made them too smart, in, in my view, uh, and therefore applying smart sanctions is just extremely challenging for, for banks, and therefore they might just say, you know what, yeah. we just won't operate. Mm. Well, that's true, mm. because, Joe, for instance, uh, country A may say, I'm okay with this country, but country B will say, no, I don't want to mm. work with this country. So mm. that makes it very difficult for international institutions to operate on a global scale. I mean, Absolutely. If, if you're an organization that's purely based in, for example, just based in Germany and you don't have any international ties, you don't have international offices, you don't trade in any other currencies outside the EU, it may be a simpler paradigm, but that's not the reality for most firms that are looking to expand globally. And so you have, you have a nexus in the US, a nexus in Russia that is a challenging yeah. situation. Do, sorry, does it make it more complicated if it's not just a sanction against a country but an individual? Absolutely, because the individual um, uh, country sanctions, when there are complete sanctions, and, and we have two you know, experts on the, on the, I think Jim could comment, but being able to uh, look at a whole country yeah. for North Korea or, or Iran at the time yeah. when the sanctions were very yeah. robust, it made the decision-making process much easier. Looking at individuals, it's also looking into the entities that they own, and that can be more complicated. I love the way, Jim, you just yeah. raised your finger there. <laughs> right. You're so polite. Well, what would you like to say? I was going to say, in <laughs> terms of the sectoral sanctions, you asked the question, not only do you have a company or an individual or a country, but you also have certain activities you can do, certain activities you cannot. So it's easy, it's hard enough to deal with the blacklist concept, but now the question is, okay, now we've got this entity and we have to figure out if this activity is within the boundaries and if they're using this activity to get around the restrictions okay. that are outside wow. the And boundary. the scale so of this <laughs> is not to be really underestimated, right. is it? We're talking fundamentally, about that's a question of access to the capital yeah. markets, and that's what everyone who's here at this conference is about, that access to the capital yeah. markets. Indeed, in and we're talking about sense. an international watch list of more than, is it 40,000 names? So, you know, sum up the complexity of the challenge. I know you've sort of outlined it already, but 40,000 so, names. So, it, so it's complex, but, but I think we have to bear in mind that if my name goes on the sanctions list, um, I'm not. Go I'm not going to try and deal, right? I'm going to. I'm going to use connections I have to get around the fact that I'm on sanctions. This you already see examples of people who perhaps have future plans to do business in Russia, setting up their joint ventures somewhere other than in the EU. So I think the more we use sanctions, the more people adapt to that sanctions regime. And as I said before, we don't live in a bipolar world anymore. And therefore, actually, each time we use sanctions, people go, oh, you know what, I'll adjust my business model so that it can adapt to the future application of sanctions. So I, we, as I said before, the more we use sanctions, the more people adapt uh, and perhaps the less effective sanctions become, even though banks have to continue doing what is demanded. It sounds of. like you, you feel sanctions really aren't the way to go. 
It's not that I don't feel that they're the way to go. I just think we need to be smart about the way we use them. So Secretary Liu in the U.S. said earlier this year, you know, we need to think carefully about how we use sanctions. Okay. Um, do we overuse them? And that's something I think is an mm -hmm. important issue. And that's critical because that is a policy debate. We, we have to remember here, what are sanctions? Sanctions are a national security yeah. measure that are close to a measure of last resort. They come from essentially wartime embargoes. The next step is essentially going to war. Joel, anything else to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I'd, I think you know, sanctions have been effective uh, since 9-11. We've seen the power of sanctions as, a, as an instrument uh, to, to, to push policy agenda, but also to change behavior. And I think the Iran sanctions, it's been well demonstrated that uh, bringing Iran to the table, that, that the mm -hmm. sanctions did make a difference in that regard. I think the question is whether they are effective in every situation. With the Russian sanctions, there is a question mark about whether behavior has actually changed, and I think time will tell. Mm -hmm. Well, we look forward and we know that, you know, uh, terrorists know that we're looking for them. So they strip as much as they can information from the, uh, the database and what goes out. Uh, would you say there will simply always be a limit to what the banking system can do to combat this issue? Is that a big challenge, Tom? So one of, one of my main research focuses on the effectiveness of Cannes Terra Finance. So after 9-11, um, you know, the banking system upped its game considerably and, and clearly has contributed to a strengthening of the system. I think today, frankly, Again, as, as Jim said, you know, people are smart. If they want yeah. to move money, they will move it through systems which aren't part of the formal banking sector. So honestly, I think we need to rethink the way we approach Cannes Terra Finance because right now, your know, approaches just simply aren't effective. We're not stopping Terra right. Finance from flowing. Do you guys agree? Well, I made that uh, distinction on the panel when we talk about state sponsors of terrorism, diversion of resources through corruption from charities and the like, that's more of a wholesale level and the financing that is needed for a big terrorist group. The, the FARC in Colombia, after generations of fighting, is now coming to uh, peaceful resolution and that's partly driven by the pressure of sanctions. Libya turned around its former regime because of the pressure of sanctions. So I think we need to distinguish that wholesale level. Jury's out in, in some cases, but as we've seen in the terrorist financing debate, the lone wolf actor, the small cell of three people that finance with 10,000 euros, that's one thing that sanctions is a little bit too broad a stick to hit. Right. Joel. Well, I, I think another takeaway from the panel today was about uh, data pooling and, and data privacy um, and about the leveraging of the, of the content that's out there. Uh, I, I think in the, in the Belgium attacks and the French attacks, there were obviously clear cases where individuals were known to, to police. Now, whether that information was widely disseminated, whether banks are pooling information enough to identify the risk elements that are out there, uh, that, that's under question. Mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously, there's more that we can all to, can do to bring data together uh, and to cooperate uh, to fight terrorism. Mm -hmm. And talking about pooling information together, do you feel that one hand is tied behind your back? Do so you have all the tools that you need here? There's, so there is no doubt that uh, the financial system uh, is not as effective as it can be because information cannot be shared. So money moves around the world uh, at the touch of a button, but information doesn't. The information to tackle terrorist finance does not. So we will not. Uh, we will not get ahead of this until information uh, can flow as easily as the money can flow. And right now. Although there seems to be a greater willingness, and one of the surveys in the panel this morning indicated that, there's a greater willingness for our information to be shared with the authorities. We're still behind uh, the level of information sharing that's needed. But, but indeed, that, that was one of the themes yeah. that we saw in the panel and got back from the audience, that the notion of protecting my privacy has been moving away towards more within appropriate boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe it is appropriate that my information to show that my activity is legitimate and keep the bad people out of the systems. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be the case that we need more attacks and, mm -hmm. and capitals all over Europe for that awareness. Right. And do you of. think other people may be excluded as a result of this? Some innocent people were excluded as a result of this, but banks think actually it's just too risky, the it, behavior. It, there certainly are, but, but again, part of what we're talking about here, people who are excluded, a lot of them, it gets back to a commercial proposition, that's where some of the new technologies that we're talking about, some of the advanced payment systems, uh, internet payments, et, et cetera, that they are opening up opportunities, in, including to better control and make sure that funds are not misused. Yeah. Joe? Yeah, I, I think what we're hearing from our customers and from the community is that there is a, more of a proactive risk scoring going on on, on all types of customers. Uh, looking, obviously, at money service businesses has been the, uh, the, uh, the very topical subject of, of de-risking. Uh, I think a lot of it is about the understanding of the data that's coming in and the risk flags that are coming in. And from a policy perspective, looking at uh, where do we want to do business, not necessarily lock stock, 
de-risking of whole sectors, but, but looking at uh, where are the individual risks based on the counterparty involved, based on the individual involved. Well, Jim, right, many... Joel, and Tom, thank, thank you, you so guys. much. We're going to carry it on forever. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much for your comments. Thank you. Well, that wraps up another lunch with Cybos. We hope you found lots of useful information over the last hour and some good ideas of what to see both inside and outside of the conference this week. And we'll be back with Cybos today at 3 o'clock. In the meantime, do stay tuned to Cybos TV for the session we've talked a great deal about today. Cybersecurity, catching the bad guys. So enjoy that right now, and we'll see you at three. See you later.